welcome to all of our medicine families all around the world. Thank you so much for tuning in to the medicine sessions. It's our fifth session. Um, for those of you that don't know Medicine Festival, it's a newly vision gathering that hopes to take place at the end of August, depending on the current social economic climate. Um, and our aim is to inspire regenerative solutions uh, for both people and planet, and of course, have a lot of fun while we're doing it. Now, we're honored to welcome both Bruce Parry and Jerome Lewis today. Uh, as we'll be following on from last week's session with Dennis McKenna around plant medicine and its role in society. But this week we'll be tapping a little deeper into the indigenous and what we can learn from them in a variety of ways, from their philosophy to their connection to nature and their respect for the sacred and how we can somehow embed that into Western society. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Bruce Parry, uh, he's a uh, Royal Marine, or was, Back in 1988, when he joined, he spent six years as a troop commander. And it was this experience that, that led him to organize um, and lead around 15 separate expeditions uh, with various, in, in, into various different remote locations around the world. Uh, and more recently, he's been making documentaries and he's certainly an indigenous rights activist. Uh, many of you may know the documentary series from the BBC, Tribe, Amazon and Arctic, which have shown Bruce exploring extreme environments living in incredibly remote locations with various indigenous, highlighting many of the important issues being faced on the environmental front line. But above all, being made to undergo some truly challenging, interesting situations at the hands of tribes people, and of course, primarily keeping us entertained in the process. <laughs> uh, he'll actually be joining us at Medicine Festival, creating a whole afternoon filled with panels and talks around living in an egalitarian society. Um, and of course, he's most recently finished his latest documentary, To Why, A Voice from the Forest. Joining him today and being interviewed by Bruce is Jerome Lewis. Jerome is a lecturer at the University of College London, uh, the Department for Anthropology, um, and he directs the Centre for Anthropology of Sustainability um, and has been working with the Bayaka hunter-gatherers for the past 30 years or so. Um, he's also a founder of Flourish and Diversity series, which took place last September. Um, I had the honour of attending, and it's it's safe to say it delivered a, a unique series of, of opportunities to, to listen and engage and converse um, and, I guess, participate too with, with a range of about 30 Indigenous representatives from across the world. What made it so unique for me, though, was the fact that it was kind of led, led by these Indigenous, primarily. Um, it, was a, it was a week of profound unification. Um, a number of powerful collaborations and ideas were birthed there, that's for sure. Um, and it led to some really important discussions that help us um, tune into and kind of see what we can do to, to, to better live in harmony um, with the systems that, that protect the planet. So if you guys have any questions for these guys, please do ask them. Um, we will be taking questions at the end in about an hour or so. Please also share the stream. Uh, we're giving away a free ticket to Medicine Festival every single week uh, following this session. Um, so with that, I think it's about time we got stuck into this, guys. Um, so I guess my first question uh, for you, Bruce, is what is egalitarianism and, and what's it like to live with an egalitarian tribe? Hey, Zach, thanks so much for that uh, introduction. And hi, Jerome, I look forward to our chat together. It's nice to see you, my friend. Yeah, uh, nice to see you. yeah, nice, man. What is egalitarianism? Well, you know what, maybe I can tell you a story. Uh, I, as you said, Zach, lived, had the great privilege of living with indigenous peoples all around the world in the making of my TV series or the TV series Tribe. Um, I went to 15 different um, indigenous groups and learned so much about so many aspects of life, whether it's community or healing or connection to nature or how to bring up your children, all these different things that um, all of these indigenous groups uh, offered that I had the great privilege of learning. But the, um, but the last group that I visited was really different. It was like, it was almost like I had to unlearn everything that I thought I knew and um, and think again, because this was a completely different group. I thought I'd seen it all. I thought I could talk forever about human nature and society with all the experiences that I'd had. But this last group 
were absolutely like a, a different paradigm for me. And uh, I found that to be uh, quite shocking that I could be so so out, really. And what it turned out was that this, this last group was the first time of all the groups that I visited that I actually visited what we what's known as an egalitarian group. All the other groups that I visited had the same problems as us as far as dealing with hierarchy and power, whereas this group was a group that had no leaders and no very very few signs of even competition, and they were all as individuals within the group, and they were all uh, fully themselves in this really beautiful way, and yet very cohesive as well. No leaders and uh, no hierarchy. And so to me, that's what egalitarianism is. But I'm really pleased that I'm here today with uh, Jerome because I know I basically met Jerome as a result of having had that experience and um, wanting to know more. Who, who was this group? What was it all about? What, what, how were they so different? What is the story? And it, it, that led me to Jerome, who's a professor of anthropology at UCL, and he specializes in these groups. And as you said, Zach, he spent the last 30 years living with a, a group in the Congo um, called the Benjeli, that I've actually now been with Jerome and his wonderful wife, Ingrid, to go and visit them. And, uh, and the experience of understanding um, the, this sort of egalitarian way has profoundly changed my life. And so it's a real honor today to have this opportunity to go a little bit deeper with you, Jerome, into your experiences and to try and eke out some of the things, because mine was just a visit. So the second half of your question, Zach, was like, what's it like to live with an egalitarian tribe? Well, I was only there for a month with the Panan. I mean, I've been back to visit them a couple of times now, and then only a few weeks with the Benjeli. But Jerome has spent years literally with these people. So. I, how can I answer that question in the in the company of Jerome? Jerome, how would you describe egalitarianism, and how would you describe what it's like to live with with people like that? Okay, well, thanks, Bruce, uh, uh, for your very uh, generous uh, introduction. I mean, I think really what it, it really helps people to think about how we live here, because obviously, for many people who've never had that opportunity that we've been very blessed to to have experienced. Um, it's difficult to imagine what that means. I mean, in, in our country, for instance, we often say, ah, oh, we're an egalitarian society, meaning Britain. Uh, and what we really mean is we're a meritocracy. We are a system which is based on merits, or at least this is the ideology of our society. So yeah, it starts at school and it continues throughout in theory. You do well, you work hard, you you study, you learn things, you, you get good grades. Uh, those good grades then enable you to go to a, a better university than someone who has less good grades, if that's what you wanted to do. Um, and, and this idea of merit uh, as being something that then allows you to progress is, is very built into the system. And capitalism is, of course, another example. You're a good trader, you, you catch a, an opportunity, you're a good businessman. You make money your merit is is what you have uh, proven by your wealth and uh, and so this idea of meritocracy is an ideology because it masks uh, profound inequalities that structurally bias the system against certain types of people so if you are uh, of a person of color uh, particularly if you are black uh, and if you are female your opportunities are quite different to a middle class white male or an upper class white male uh, it, within that meritocratic system. And there are various reasons for that we don't need to go into. I think most people understand. Um, and, and if you're even located in different places, so people born in the north of this country have less easy access to the benefits of this so-called meritocratic system than people born in the south. There are all sorts of inequalities built into the system that don't that mean that, in fact, we don't all start from the same page. So that's one way of thinking about egalitarianism. But uh, what's very interesting, I think, about what you just briefly described with the Penan and, and what certainly we've experienced with Mbenjele is that there are other ways of addressing human difference. Um, for instance, uh, the basic fact is that all human beings are unique and different. And some people are better at running, some people are stronger, some people 
have more intelligence, some people are more beautiful, some people are more seductive, some are better dancers. There's all sorts of things that differentiate us. And as we go through life, life of course, the set of possibilities that are genetic predispositions uh, enable us to are affected by what we experience and the things that happen to us as those uh, bodies grow. And, and, and all these factors mean that everybody is different. Each of us is unique. So the idea of meritocracy, that we all start from some baseline of equality, is that is the, the first sort of ideological step of our society. Whereas in these other societies, it's quite a different, the, what I would call, and I think you mean when you talk about egalitarian societies. Uh, these are small-scale hunter-gatherer societies around the world, particularly between the tropics. They don't exist uh, very far north or very far south because uh, the uh, temperature extremes that you experience as you move away from the tropics mean that you get periods of scarcity. And once you get periods of scarcity, it requires hoarding and storage and so on in order to overcome that period. And that is a very easy space for inequalities to develop. In these hunter-gatherer societies, they recognize that some people will be better hunters than others. Uh, some people will be better singers or dancers. But the society organizes itself so that those special skills that one person has do not enable that person to gain status, to assert authority, or to somehow control the behavior or freedoms of other people. And so what they do is they accept that we're all different and then they put in institutions within the society that make sure those differences cannot be converted into status, power or authority. So for instance, the good hunter who comes back regularly with meat, as soon as he gets towards camp, all the kids start calling out, wah, wah, wah! come out, come out, come out. And, and they tell everyone to come out because meat has arrived. And, and, and everyone's really excited about that because of course, you know, we love food. And, uh, and the hunter has the animal taken from him. And one of his friends just comes along, takes it away from him, opens it up, uh, you know, sorts it out so that it's all in nice pieces for sharing with everybody present. And the hunter sits there quietly, doesn't say anything about the hunt, doesn't boast about the amazing, I mean, these are, you know, deadly combats. Hunting is not a, a light thing. It is a deadly combat every time. It's highly dramatic. But the hunter just sits quietly there, doesn't say anything, and watches to make sure that his meat is properly cut up. And once it's all been cut up, everyone who's in the camp brings a leaf, puts it around the animal, or each family actually brings a leaf, and, and then a, a pile of meat is put on that leaf. And the, the animal is immediately shared out and distributed among everybody present. So that really powerfully ensures that that hunter cannot get status from what they do. So this po process of constantly sharing everything that you take out of nature is what they uh, uh, is, is that is their economic system. It's an economic system based on what we call demand sharing. The um, Panarin have a slightly different one though, don't they? They're not the demand sharing in the same way. I, I noticed when I was with the Panan, I mean, I'd been with hunter-gatherers in other parts of the world and I'd seen sharing, but normally it was like you catch a pig and it'd be one leg for you, one leg for you. Whereas when I was with the Panan, literally the tongue would be cut 12 times the leg each leg would be cut the liver would be cut for everyone it was so fastidious the level of sharing that happened but there is this subtle difference isn't there between what they call demand sharing and more of the sort of offering sharing which i experienced with the panan but they're still both egalitarian types of of of, of um peoples is that right yeah, I mean, I've never lived with a Penan, so I, I, you know, but the the reports, the ethnography, at least of how they lived before palm oil took over all their forests and, mm. and the, uh, the pressures that resulted from that devastation, um, you know, they were considered in the anthropological literature as uh, demand sharing, what we call immediate returners. Uh, so these are people who don't live uh, as we do, working for a return at some delayed point in time, they work for what you produce that day and that day you just eat. And if you've got enough after you've been out for one hour, well, then you go back to your camp and you enjoy the, the abundance you found. There's no question of hoarding and gathering more than you need immediately and so on. Um, but the sharing uh, happens at many levels. So what you've just described is very typical of egalitarian hunter-gatherers, this minute attention to sharing, even when there's no real reason to share, but just to show that you care. Uh, and that's something that we forget when 
uh, when you do sharing is that it's also a very important sign of, of care, love. Uh, and so think of families, for instance, within the family, it would be preposterous to start uh, limiting and, and you, you share. And, 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 and that's how a happy family actually exists. You, you share your resources together. Um, but then as you go beyond kin, then it starts to get more complicated in our society. Um, and that's one of the characteristics of these societies. Everybody is kin. Mm. Uh, and, and not just people, but the non-humans that you have interactions with as well. Um, there's a, a sense of extended kinship to the whole world, uh, which doesn't exclude anybody, can't exclude anybody. Yeah, the Penan said to me on a couple of occasions, you know, I went with them into town and I would offer to buy them something or, or give them to, um, some money to buy something. And they would never accept anything unless it was shared, unless there was something for everyone else, even though they weren't present. They would never consider going into town and getting something unless they could get something for everyone else in the group. They were so specific about it. And, uh, yeah, it was just very different to other groups that I've been with. It was really very beautiful. That, that The way you described that was really nice. Yeah, in Southeast Asia, there does seem to be a, a, a real focus on sharing for the sake of sharing uh, and the aesthetics of sharing uh, in, in, in a very interesting way. Uh, in Africa, the, the sharing is, is much more brusque. You know, there's a, a demand and there's you know, no sense of a thank you. Of course, there's no thank yous in these. It's just the expectation of your shared humanity that should, uh, you know, make you share. And we, we, we put power into sharing. You know, often in the West, uh, I, I notice it with, with uh, school kids, you know, the kid will share with two of his friends, but not with the third and the fourth. And it becomes a, a way of showing favoritism to those, oh, you're nicer, and then making the other ones want to, uh, you know, be nicer to you so they get shared with in future. And there's a whole manipulation of sharing when it's the donor who promotes it. But if it's the recipients who demand it, and this is why we call it demand sharing, then the donor can't control the output uh, in, the, in the way that we do here. And so that enables uh, the sharing to happen without the possibility of power. So the, the demands are important. Um, and the Penan case where people do that is because um, the, the demand is made by your presence. Uh, just being there in those societies is enough. Well, of course, there's someone here. They need to share. It's not a question. But what's rather beautiful, and, and this is something often children do, is this minute sharing of every single, even though it's not enough to even have a mouthful when they've killed a little bird or something, um, it's still shared meticulously with everybody, all the kids who are present. But the Penan did say to me that it was a taught thing. They were like, we, we are often asking and advising our children to do this. And it was interesting the words they used. They, didn't, they said they didn't tell them. They weren't forcing them, they were inviting them. And it feels like this sort of non-coercive form of child rearing is an interesting thing. Is that the same with the Benjeli? Yeah, they are extraordinarily indulgent parents. Uh, it, it's really very touching. I was a, a, a young father uh, while I was there. And uh, my dear son, three years old at the time, and he had to eat these awful tasting chloroquine tablets for uh, his prophylactic against malaria. And uh, over the months, you know, he, he began very sort of solidly uh, gulping them down despite this awful taste. But then after a few months, he was just fed up with it and he just refused. And of course, I was paranoid that he would uh, end up getting malaria. And, uh, and there was one time when he just wouldn't swallow his thing. And I, we just ended up having this, I got into a fury. I was so embarrassed. And, uh, and I, I slapped him. It's the only time I've ever uh, slapped a child. And, uh, and the Benjali just came to me and said, what are you doing? You don't behave like that. That's not how you, you treat children. And I was so humiliated and ashamed of myself, quite rightly so. Um, um, and, and this sort of indulgence, you, you don't uh, restrain children. You allow them to fully explore themselves in all their dimensions, positive and negative. And you know that it will be the group as a whole that will gently show them the way back to acceptable behavior through mockery and teasing uh, or reenacting. So uh, girls and, and women in particular, if they see people doing stupid stuff, they don't comment while they're doing it. They, everyone just watches. But then afterwards, they start reenacting what they just did with a nice comical uh, twist to it. And the person who was... Uh, 
behaving uh, in some sort of unacceptable way slowly realizes that it's them that's being uh, uh, parodied and uh, and they won't stop till that person laughs which is a very interesting psychological process um, in terms you know accepting yourself with laughter with humor is a very powerful transformative uh, process Talking of tools, I think this is the most interesting area in a way, Jerome, because like it's all very well, people listening and going, well, that's great in a small community in the middle of the forest when there's abundant resources and that's so far away from anything where, where I'm at in my life. And like we have to have strictures on children because they might run into the streets and all sorts of things that feel so different. But what, I, what I've taken away from my time with these groups is the methodologies and the tools that they've used for maintaining this balance, for maintaining this 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 type of society that they have, and it's um, and I wonder if we could enter into that space a little bit. It's uh, rather than I mean we can paint the picture of how wonderful it is, but it feels almost utopian and so distant. What? But if we could explore a little bit some of the tools as you just did, then um, we could perhaps see how um, how we could maybe emulate some of that in our own lives here i mean like the idea of teasing someone until they laugh too so that they break into the group and become at one with the group because it's actually done from love rather than from ridicule is the most e extraordinarily touching story i remember you also telling me jerome about the the hunter that started showing off that he was the best hunter maybe you could um, having given us the idea of what a meritocracy is, whereby in our society, the best hunter, we would always imagine the best hunter gets the most meat. You've told us about the story of the hunter sitting down, but there was also a story you once told me of, of, of the hunter that, that started showing off that he was the best hunter. Um, yeah. And what, what did they do about that? that? That's a very good example, actually, of the complications of living in an egalitarian society. So this man... Uh, loves hunting i mean uh, from his point of view he is just a brilliant hunter and he loves to go hunting it is a very dramatic uh, experience as i mentioned and uh, and so he would go hunting and uh, he was a, an elephant hunter the bambanjali have uh, a whole tradition of elephant hunting that goes back for millennia or centuries at least if not millennia and uh, and so he went off elephant hunting and one time he he hunted the elephant an elephant which had the biggest tusks that had ever been uh, met in uh, seen in the region in living memory. So he was taken down to Brazzaville with his tusks, and it seems to have had a very profound uh, impact on him, because as I mentioned, you know, a hunter comes and sits quietly after the hunt, doesn't say what they've been doing, but he must have been celebrated for he was down there for a couple of months uh, as this great hunter, and and just it, it inflated his ego. He just couldn't help himself but boast, and and he would boast. And he boasted so much that people stopped liking to be in his camp. So he ended up in these very tiny camps with him, his wife, and just kids and a couple of uh, his in-laws. And he would hunt and hunt and hunt. And his you know, smoking table, you smoke, you smoke meats to keep it fresh until you can eat it. And his smoking table became so piled high with meat. When people walked through his camp, they'd say, pygmies don't hunt like this. <laughs> you know? and, and he would look at them and say, well, I just love hunting. But in their society, the most important things people do are ideologically made dependent on other people. So if uh, you're a good hunter, it's because you haven't spoilt your ekila, which is your, your internal force. Your, the, 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 you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex word, which is almost impossible to translate into an English, well, it is impossible to translate into an English word. But uh, so you depend on the actions of others. You have to share all your meat amongst everybody. You have to make sure that everybody gets a portion. Nobody feels left out or they will spoil your Aquila just by their jealous thinking um, or resentful thinking. Um, and you need to give the hunter's meat to the men, which is a particular set of uh, internal organs. And you need to eat a certain thing like the heart and, and other parts, depending on what the animal is. Anyway, Ben Asongo, because he was just living in these tiny camps, piling up meat, he obviously wasn't sharing properly. And, uh, and this made people annoyed, you know. Um, and from time to time, he would end up in bigger camps. Uh, and in one occasion, uh, there he was hunting away. And the women started to get annoyed. And the men started to get annoyed. And they said, look, Ben Asongo, can you stop hunting so much? Get, let someone else go hunting for a change. And this is, again, so the group feels that everybody's contributing to their well-being and not just one person. 
So Ben Asongo, he said, well, why, why should I stop hunting? I love hunting. It's what I like doing. And so he carried on hunting. And his, his male friends started to get very suspicious of him. Why are you doing this so much? What's wrong with you? And, and, and so he was cursed to meet gorillas. Every time he went in the forest, or not every time, but very often, I've never met someone who met so many gorillas, he would be charged by silverback gorillas. And, uh, and this is extremely dangerous. They're terrifying. It's a particular ngile. These are lone males who've been kicked out of their troop by one of the younger males having beaten them off. And, and then they have to roam as these lone males, rogue males, if you like. And, and they are the ones who tend to be grumpy often because they've had an injury in the, that last battle that still bugs them to, to the, uh, you know, in their old age. And, uh, and so Ben Asongo kept getting attacked by these gorillas and he, he didn't understand why. And he realized he must have been cursed by his friends, but he continued hunting anyway. The normal thing in that situation is you stop hunting to get your Aquila back together. There's certain potions and so on to drink. Um, and uh, he instead carried on and his, one day he saw an elephant. He only had one bullet left in his gun and he saw an elephant and his father-in-law said to him, go and kill that elephant, which father-in-laws can do. And so he felt pressured. He shot the elephant. When he'd finished uh, cutting up the meat, or he began butchering the meat, the others went to camp to get the women, and the women refused to come. They said, "We're no, we're not cooking your meat anymore." And and he said, "Well, I've just, and it, it, he, you know, when you cut an elephant up, it takes four or five hours of very hard work. It's no, no small job." And uh, and nobody came to pick up the meat. He was outraged. He went to camp, and uh, and there was a big round. The women said, "No, we're not cooking your meat anymore." Effectively, they exiled him. And he then had to leave the Bambenjele, his native home, and, and the only place that would accept him was some, another group of pygmies across the river called the Baluma. And the women were really persuaded that he was using bad sorcery because he wasn't using their ritual capture of animals. So women capture men's animals ritually first by singing certain songs that enchant the forest, enchant the spirits of the animals. And in the case of big game, they tie them up so that the men can find them. But Ben Asongo wasn't using this ritual process. He was just going out and killing animals all over the place. He must be a sorcerer. He must have some mystical, uh, and so he was dangerous. And, and that exiled him. And, and I met him in 2012. He'd had to move to another group of pygmies, and I suspect because he continued boasting. And, it, and the group, the Baluma, who he went to after the Bambenjeli, they also kicked him out. So he moved through all these different groups because he couldn't stop boasting. He couldn't just control himself and, and hold it. Together. So ultimately, exile was their tool for um, for trying to bring him into, or, or threat of exile was the tool for trying to bring him into into alignment with this sort of non-boasting agreement that they all have, or at least before that, the women refusing to cook his food. I think that's super interesting, and the men kind of. Um, also like trying to cajole him you know it's uh, it's very different to how we would imagine that that, that that he's lauded in actual fact it feels like it's the other way it's like if when you start when you start going down this path of showing off that actually the people retract from you rather than raise you up and i think that that's an interesting thing for us to think about because obviously in our world as you mentioned meritocracy but also the competitive element of our society it seems to reward the competition winners, but it feels like they have a very different understanding of competition being almost like not healthy for society. Would that be fair? Absolutely right. Competition is, it, it's like not sharing, uh, you know, hoarding uh, or having more than other people. It's what destroys abundance. And yeah. everything they do is geared towards producing, generating, enjoying abundance. Mm -hmm. And so, joy is actually really important in this process they have all sorts of institutions which are specifically designed to produce as much joy as possible uh, and and the more joy you produce the luckier the happy you know the more stuff you'll have joy produces abundance and uh, and there if you i mean i i don't think religion is a fair description of their religious practices their ritual and ceremony but uh, but their religion really is all about producing joy and the things that they value most, much more than elephant meat or, or piles of meat or anything else, is uh, the, the ability to call forest spirits that produce joy. And when you succeed in calling those forest spirits and you produce that joy, the forest is happy. Uh, and, and then they, they, they point to little birds twirping in the tr trees or the way a monkey sings out to, to other monkeys. 
you know, the, the forest needs to hear those happy sounds, those joyful sounds of animals. And if a camp is full of screaming, shouting, crying, fighting, biting, then uh, uh, the forest closes itself to that camp. So what people do is they avoid others with whom they have great problems or who where they produce those kinds of stressful sounds. Uh, and so avoidance is, is their main conflict resolution. You often, people have a, a, a disagreement. They don't take it further. They just get up and go. And it's because they haven't got all sorts of stuff that they need to protect. Um, you know, you can fit your whole household in a basket uh, that's about you know, that round. Uh, and, you know, just your, everything you own can fit in that basket. And you can just pack it up within 20 minutes, half an hour, and you're on your way. Um, so there's no need to get into all those long, drawn-out arguments and discussions. They can. They, of course, do happen. People do argue and, and fight. But, uh, but you don't need to. And it's that freedom from having uh, vital resources that people can uh, prevent you from enjoying that, that gives people the freedom we don't know, a freedom that we can't even imagine. Freedom's a really interesting one, isn't it? It's like um, they with this sort of non-coercive way of being um that the, the at, at its heart is this freedom but the but it's not freedom in the same way that we see freedom it's like you know the sort of like the north american sort of um desire for the american dream it's like this sort of like uh, the, the fight for liberty is a very individualistic sort of dream whereas it feels to me that they they have this immense freedom but they still have this extraordinarily collective mindset do you see a, a, a is are they opposites or are they is that something that they can hold quite naturally in their world? Well, I think you put your finger on it really. I mean, what we have in you know capitalist systems is this idea of individual freedom. And they of course have that. It's very strong, but it's linked into and connected to the joy we have in association with others, cooperation. And you know, freedom without cooperation is as we know something that can become very toxic uh, in human relationships but freedom within the context of cooperation with others suddenly becomes something really truly liberating because other people then give you your freedom allow you your freedom without jealousy without uh, you know trying to undermine it or trying to uh, somehow make it uh, uh, you know complicated for you because they, they're upset that you do and they don't um, uh, and, and so what happens here in this context is your autonomy is a very sensitive one. The way people sing is how they learn this. And this is something which perhaps is, is, a, is an important one to bear in mind. So their style of singing are these dense polyphonies, vocal polyphonies. It's not, there's no, we, we sing monophonies generally. So, you know, there's one melodic line and everyone sings along to it. Whereas what's happening in these polyphonies is each singer will have their own melodic line. And because they know which melodic lines fit different songs, they've been singing like this for, since childhood, um, you know, probably since they, before they can even walk. Uh, and, and, and so they're able to really um, understand how you can contribute your uniqueness into the group to create something that goes right above the group that is much more beautiful than any individual within that group could produce. And so these polyphonies, you overlap these melodies, overlap the melodies, and suddenly it produces a, a song above all those individual melodies, which is truly exquisite, is just mind-bogglingly beautiful. And, uh, and, and there are particular moments in those rituals where that beauty is enough to take you into the, uh, you know, what the Veda called no mind or Buddha called no mind, take you into this space which is beyond your ego, which is a, a consciousness which is expansive, which, which extends out and encompasses not just the people around you, but the forest, the other species, the other non-humans. Uh, and in, in a very tangible way, it's not a, a dreamy, wishy-washy, drunken sort of feeling. It's an intense uh, uh, perception, an intense awareness of that. Uh, and, and they have all these different devices like this sort of singing, which uh, allow you to experience that abundance of joy, but at the same time uh, to really understand your freedom is something which is most beautifully expressed when it's in combination with others, when it's in cooperation with others. 
uh, and it and it, and it, it it just reinforces this in a very non-linguistic way. It's you always diminish it by trying to speak about it, um, or at least I do. Um, and but what really it's about is is understanding deep inside you that your freedom depends on other people's freedom, that your freedom depends on uh, your cooperation and appreciation for them. So when you sing like this, if you sing too loud, you drown out the other people. If you sing too quietly, you're not contributing to it. So there's listening carefully to what other people are doing, because if you sing the same melodies they sing, then it becomes non-polyphony. We're all singing the same melody. It's just a, a monophony. So it, it's also very carefully being tuned in to what other people are doing and finding your different space to do your thing within that. Um, and, and those sorts of lessons are very profound um, ones to, to realize uh, as, as, as you try and you know, understand what, what is what is healthy freedom as opposed to the sort of acquisitive freedom, the, the ego-based freedom that we seem to you know, celebrate within our own society. Well, I mean, the way you describe that singing, Jerome, is, is exquisite. I, I've, I've had the great privilege of you, as you have many times, of, of touching on that. And uh, I've, I've not been able to sing the, the polyphony in the, in the sort of individualistic way um, but I have managed to be actually with you and Ingrid with uh, Back and Beyond. You remember where we we all took, um, we all had our own little mantras within this, like four groups have a mantra within it. And it is true. I remember that when you get into the the routine of having your own, and then you uh, having your own part of the tune, and then you then you have to then concentrate on not being too loud to listen to the others. I did have that experience of actually leaving myself somewhat, and and I remember when I was also with the Benjeli, which was which was extraordinary. The 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 way that they sing and dance was so complex to join in. It's like almost like every time they clapped, it felt like it was a semi quaver later than I would naturally clap. Clap. So I had to stay so switched on, and also the feet. The way their feet moved was so counterintuitive to me. It almost felt like they, their, their dance was like subtly, it was subtly out to how I would naturally have moved. Or maybe it's just because I'm a crap dancer, but it felt to me like my, my mind was having to work so hard to stay present. That was the point. I was, it was like I, I couldn't drift off. I had to be fully present with the clapping and the foot movement. And it took up so much mental energy, and then the song on top, that, uh, that there was no room for the voice of my head to be talking. I was like fully, fully, fully present. And then you can find yourself being a part of something. And uh, I can imagine if you grow up with that, that would be just what an extraordinary experience to have at your fingertips with all your friends at all times. This is the ability to connect with the, with the, the realm, the realm that is. And I'm sure you've had that many times. Can, can you give us an example of, of some of your own experiences like that, Jerome? I think you put that very beautifully, Bruce. Um, well, there, I mean, maybe just to, to share some of the different ways that it can happen. So, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the challenge for, you know, well, me as well, I find it extraordinarily challenging to try and keep up with my song uh, hand claps, my hand and feet movements, and then your bottom has to do something different, and it's all going in its own rhythm. Um, but they, within these different genres, and, and uh, there are different energies of joy that you can access. So um, you may remember you were initiated into Shu, mm -hmm. one of the men's uh, 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 forest spirits. And that forest spirit is embodied just by the men, all with their arms over each other's shoulders. And as they dance up and down the camp, they stamp their feet really hard and they sing in these very bassy, big voices, uh, polyphonies, of course, overlapping with one another. So they become bonded into this group that moves up and down the camp. And if it's at night, the women and the children start to feel a bit frightened by this big, strong, masculine energy and go into their huts. Um, and, and while that may seem like the men are intimidating and, and forcing people out, actually, because those are the men who will be protecting you should you need it, uh, it's very comforting to feel that your men are really strong, you know, frightening sounding men. 
and so the sort of joy that that, that produces is is a it, it's it's a it's, it's like l being in your tent in the rain you know where you're all cozy and nice and and you know that you're safe and protected but there's something big and powerful outside i i remember when i was as you say like a rugby scrum with my arms around them running up and down the village um center uh in in one of these displays of show uh and it, 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 this is actually one of the most profound moments I had when I was uh, with the Ben Jelly, um, because when we talk about this sort of non-competitive element, it, it's and this is the problem I had when I first met the Panam. It's it's almost invisible. You you know you look at them and they they seem the same as any other group, but I just knew when I met the Panam first, the feeling I had inside me was that something was completely different. I, there was something, some part of me that wasn't able to, to, to come to bear, which was normally always present in every other group that I've been with, which was almost, and it, and it took me a long, long time to figure out what this was. It was like an invisible element that was, that was just not present. And when I, when I was with the Benjeli and we were charging up and down in this rugby scrum, someone threw out this big stick, this really long stick, and it sort of landed in front of us. And, and the, all these guys, they're strong, muscly African guys. They're like half got one side, half got the other side. And we're all tussling with this with this stick, you know. And, and it literally the stick divided the group in half. And I, in my head, was like, well, clearly this is the moment when a bunch of lads get together and we have a little tug of war, you know. That's just what's happening here. But then what I noticed was all of these hands and all of these muscles and all of these, like, sort of gruff noises of... <laughs> but they're it never in any way became us against them. It never in any way became, I'm gonna show myself to be a little bit more than you. It, it just wasn't present. Every, the thing went backwards and forwards, but it was joyful and it was in no way was it ever about me. It just was not about me. And, and you could sense in that moment, it really it just makes my heart seeing now remembering it it was like god this is what it can be like to be in a true brotherhood it's like this is a brotherhood where we are masculine we are male there is power here but it's for each other and it's for supporting rather than for for individual meanness and like those moments invisible as they may be were the times that really profoundly affected me so much which has driven me to this uh, journey of wanting to share these experiences so much because it was it was different and I didn't get that in other tribes you know where, where the power and hierarchy and leadership and shamanism all these things have come in and there's this different type of society and then these egalitarian ones it's like they've got these tools that they work out on a daily basis to maintain balance to maintain not letting anyone get above uh, but they do it in this joyful way mm -hmm. and and yet they, but these tools are the things that I'm interested in, you know. Um, well, you, I mean, I remember that uh, moment very well with the stick in, in your show initiation. It was beautiful um, and very powerful, you know, really, oh. those are strong men. But um, that, it begins with children's games. They have no games which have winners or losers. The, the, the way they work is, um, let me give you an example. So there's a game where children will find a, a young sapling that's probably about you know 10 meters, 30 feet high. Uh, and then they all start climbing up till they get to the top. And as they get to the top, the, the top of the, the bough, uh, the, the branches come down towards the ground till it's touching the ground. And then they decide who's gonna be the lucky one. And then that person holds on. And then all the other goes, one, two, three, <clears throat> and they drop off and then <laughs> 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 the kid has this you know, really whoa, amazing. And then all the other kids, they all climb up again, then another bunch jump off and someone else has a go. And, and so it's the collaboration of everyone doing it together, which is what gives the joy and the pleasure. And, and, and their games are organized like that so that it's not about you know, winning, losing. It's about how can we coordinate ourselves so effectively that we have an, a beautiful experience and, we can, and everyone laughs, of course, and there's lots of joy. So it's something which is, it has to <coughs> infiltrate right across uh, so many different elements, the, the children's games, the way children interact with each other, uh, and, and, and it goes on through, through adult life and, and religious ritual practice too. The other area that was so powerful for me um, was, of course, the, the, the role of the women in the society, Jerome. And I know it's like two 
guys now are going to enter into this uh, this slightly more complex area. Maybe one day I'll have a deeper chat with uh, Ingrid about it because I, I know that she's got some extraordinary profound insights from her own time when you were together in, in, as a family down there. Um, but maybe um, if you if you wouldn't mind offering us an insight into some of the um, the way <coughs> this sort of uh because of course it's very different to our type of society where we're sort of moving away from this um uh binary view of sex and gender and yet it's very strong there in in, the, in those groups and yet it has this this capacity for being able to be one of the primary tools that they use for maintaining balance and um you know, I don't want to dwell there too long because it's a whole wormhole in its own right. But maybe you could um, express a little bit of this other tool that is so interesting, which is the the, the role of the women in holding in, in holding space and maintaining balance. Yeah. So I I, I just explained about this um, institution we call Mwajo, which is how you know women reenact the bad behaviors. Women really are the sort of the moral arbiters of society. And, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's an important leadership role uh, that women take on board. Um, so that when they do those kinds of uh, reenactments, that's one very important way that moral values are shared. But then they also, and, and women control this because they don't provoke violence. If men start to do that to each other, it can turn bad and men can start fighting and, and, and that's not something people want. So men normally never do that. They won't comment on each other's behaviors in those ways. They do it for animals. Men will spend all their time reenacting animals and, and behaving and showing, teaching each other how animals behave. Women do it for people. Uh, and, um, and so within that role, and I mentioned how women are the ones who catch the animals that men then go and hunt. So they actually take responsibility for the actions of men supplying those animals. It's men just, elephant hunting is called mwakaya baito, a woman's hunt, because it's the women who've hunted the elephant first. Um, so the, the women very, have a, a very important role in preventing status competition between men. And, and, and men feeling that they're somehow you know, above the women. And because, of course, men have brawn. Uh, in general, there's slight sexual dimorphism in human beings, so men tend to be stronger, bigger built than women. Uh, and that advantage could turn sour if it wasn't dealt with appropriately by society. So in these societies, women have a whole range of these things that do that. And one of the very important ones is, are these ritual uh, relationships. And uh, as you will remember, no doubt, uh, when we were in the village, uh, uh, the Ngoku, the women's spirit, it's a, a, a frog spirit, which uh, is, is very watery, uh, it's, uh, it's very uh, sexualized, but not in the sense of um, performing for the male gaze in the way that, uh, you know, I don't know, tabletop dancers or whatever they're called, do in this society uh, or pornography in that it's, it's, you know, it's always the man framing the image that he wants of the woman. What this is, is women uh, celebrating their beauty, their sexuality, their seductiveness, their eroticism on their own terms. And that's something quite different. So what happens is the whole group of women, the, the, you, I mean, as a, as a father, it would be your daughter with your wife, with your mother, with your mother-in-law, uh, and, and all your aunties and, and sisters and, and so on. Um, the, all the women of the, the camp or the group will come together as one, dancing into camp as one. And as they're dancing into camp, their songs are full of humor, but a very ribald humor. Uh, so they will tease men uh, for their our, our sexual inadequacies. <clears throat> the penis only produces a, a urine. Uh, you know, vaginas produce babies as well as urine, and, and you know they really are superior. <laughs> um, uh, or uh, you know, the, the penis is already tired. The vagina always wins. Um, you know, they're talking about of course. Uh, sexual intercourse and and there are lots of ways in those songs that they educate men in how men should behave properly sexually because of course sexual relations are a really important part of male female relationships uh, and and so it's very important that women in, impose 
the terms on which those relationships should happen. And that's what Ngoku does, is it really tells men, look, if you want to have sex with us, you've got to behave properly. And these are some of the ways you need to behave properly. But they won't do it in the tick, tick, tick way that we do it. What they do is they reenact. Uh, so they, you, know, you probably remember those hilarious scenes where those young girls were pretending to screw each other and, and one of them pretending to be a drunk man you know, and, and trying to oh, I can't get it in and, oh, and like, oh it's too soft and uh, and then anyway but uh, then and so they go on just imitating the stupid behavior of men or, and and it's a very powerful way of educating men and educating the women on what's not to accept and what is acceptable in sexual relationships so uh, and, 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 and in moving into the camp like that, because they're using sexuality, men tend to get very sort of embarrassed because the women are being so explicit, so upfront, and, and it just cowers men into just watching and, and listening. And, and because those women are the women they love, the, the women they do find sexy, uh, there's also that it is beautiful to watch, but at the same time, it's very insulting and it's... Hmm. Uh, and and it, the, the, the women are brilliant at playing on that uh, uh, desire, the wanting for woman that man has, uh, but also then being taught, well, it's got to be on these terms and these are very strict and we won't accept any uh, tomfoolery or mucking around. And, and when women start that, men really don't uh, try and argue with them. You would just be, you know, they would all gang up on you if you try to make any fuss saying, well, stop insulting penises or something like that. And, uh, and and so you just wouldn't dare as a man. It would just Do you think that the main reason that the, that, the, 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 that that happens is because all of the women are involved? It's the solidarity of the whole that is the main power there that is holding. In a sense, it feels to me like the way you describe it and the way I experienced it is like these two qualities of power. Um, and the women have their own quality of power, but they're not, they're not, they're, they're not trying to challenge the, the, the masculine or the men um, using the same quality of power as the men are exhibiting, but they have their own quality, which is equally powerful, maybe even more powerful, mm. um, which is, as you just described, the sort of sexuality, the teasing, the, the joking, the laughter, the song, the dance, but it's, it's their own way of doing things. But at the heart of it is this sort of, this subliminal threat of a sex strike, of a, of a sort of like, if you, if you don't fucking behave, stop competing, stop being but lazy lovers, stop um, just, you know, being aggressive in the home or whatever it is, then then we as a collective are going to step yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, and, and it struck me that, uh, that that was a really powerful insight into how to deal with power. We're living in a world at the moment with this very centralized, strong, competitive, aggressive male power bodies. And, and you know, whether or not it's the role of women or whether it's just to us for, to, to, to look at the example of those amazing women and figure out how we can use those, not try and tackle power using the same quality of power, but learn from those amazing women about how we could also deal with um, power in a different way. Um, it struck me that that was another one of these tools that I'm so, so, so keen to like try and unpick to look at the world that we're in today and 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 find a way through to a slightly more uh, harmonious future because uh, it feels to me that power is very out of uh, out of kilter in our society today and here's 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 a group of people that are, are, what you've told me in the past it's like this this was the way of being this type of society was the way of being for all of humanity uh, from the, when we first stood upright all the way up until the Neolithic revolution, you know, the agricultural revolution, which is 180, 190,000 years. It's like 95% of our time on the planet. And so that's how we were. Um, and then we've got out of kilter in this, like, into this, this new way, well, this sort of repetition of an old way of being, which is a sort of much more dominant, hierarchical, male aggressive type of society that we're in now. And here is the secret key ingredient of these few remaining societies that have these insights into how to diffuse power rather than fight it, how to diffuse it rather than challenge it head on. And I just found that to be so compelling. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 
yeah it just it, you know it just struck me so it just the, the the experience of being there and then listening to the theories that you and your wife ingrid and then um chris knight and camilla power have come out with all of these insights into this other way of being it feels like another paradigm to me but it feels like something that's tangible it's something that could be well I, you're absolutely right so it's something which you know i sort of detect the hints of it coming through i mean covid in a in a very interesting way has uh provided perhaps an opportunity for us to return to some of the the, the cyclical way that that happens so um I mean, going back to, you mentioned Chris Knight and Camilla Power, uh, and I'd strongly recommend any of you to read their work. It's beautiful if you're interested in these things. Um, and what it really is focused on is trying to explain this conundrum of human evolution. Uh, in all primate societies, brains don't get bigger than about 600 cc. Uh, Homo sapiens brains get up to, well, 13. Uh, they've gone a bit smaller recently, actually. But uh, hunter-gatherer Homo sapiens brains get to 13, 1400 cc. Um, apparently, we're now going around 1250 or something like that. Um, but uh, but that's because in primate societies you always have these extreme hierarchies. And in trying to understand, so you have the hierarchy. The well, you don't always they they have very varied social arrangements. But I'm thinking particularly about gorillas and, and chimpanzees that are our closest relatives. You have very uh, strict hierarchies and you have a harem of females dominated by the alpha and the alpha will impregnate all the females uh, and if another alpha wants to come along he has to first defeat that first alpha then he goes off killing all the children he can get his hands on and then re-impregnating the females with his offspring and uh, and in such a system we, females don't have any help in child rearing so in the occasional case where uh, primates in evolutionary history have exceeded the 600 centimeters of brain uh, they have ended up dying out when conditions got harder and the great conundrum of explaining human evolution is how did we get to a position where uh, females were able to recruit sufficient help to sustain these increasingly uh, juvenile infants uh, so we have this Babies are a very peculiar feature of human child rearing. They're really uh, costly as they breastfeed. They can't walk. They can't look after themselves. Horses, you know, within a, 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 an hour of birth, they they can walk around. Uh, little cobras are born. They're, they're already poisonous. Um, so uh, in human situation, women, our females, are very dependent on support. And that support first came, and th these are, of course, all hypotheses, but the ones I think are most reasonable, uh, first came through grandmothers because a mother knows that her child is her child and so will support her. And menopause is a very unusual phenomenon and part of the explanation for it is that uh, women are able to give support to their offspring once they reach menopause because they're no longer carrying their own. And that was a gave important survival advantages to these mothers birthing these very dependent children. Um, and, and so... Uh, women develop that solidarity which we were just discussing in the case of uh, uh, the uh, um, Bangeli. But also they did this on a cyclical basis so that <clears throat> one of the big problems human beings had as they left trees, homo sapiens, is big cats. And big cats have excellent night vision and when they hunt is when it's dark, when it's really dark, when it's no moon. And what we see in these hunter-gatherer societies still today is that the main rituals that people do are on no moon. And we see right throughout uh, in mythology a sort of a connection between loud noise and very dark times. And, and of course, we, you know, why do we love partying so much? You know, people get exhausted after two hours doing something, but go to a, a, a nightclub or, or, or a good rave or dance party or something. People would dance for nine, 10 hours, 12 hours and, and feel exhilarated and, and happy afterwards. And, and these are all parts of these ancient mechanisms that we have uh, that we still, you know, we, we still feel them and, 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 and that's why we get the pleasure. And so, these early groups of grandmothers, daughters, sisters uh, would have been supporting. They would have been the first groups, really, of 
uh, people similar to us, probably Homo uh, erectus, uh, and we, you know, we can. I can't go into all the reasons for this now, but but basically, we can see the beginnings of song uh, in that period. I think uh, the evidence is is quite uh, uh, clear and persuasive on that. From from my point of view, people won't all agree with me, of course. Um, but uh, but so what we have is a, a movement of ritual coming together in the no moon, women coming together and and slowly over, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years here, uh, Homo uh, habilis or Homo egasta, for instance, two and a half million years they, they existed on the planet, very successful adaptation. By comparison, Homo sapiens, as you mentioned, probably around 300, 350,000 years old, uh, we're, we're new kids on the block. Uh, and within that time, we, we've almost <laughs> destroyed the very basis of life on this planet for the majority of species. I mean, we're, we're heading towards the sixth great extinction uh, if we continue as we, we are without change. So the big challenge that uh, uh, we have is somehow to, to understand, as you've been very eloquently uh, explaining, these ancient practices which have stood humanity in really good stead for a very long time and help explain how we were able to develop encephalization to the point that we have done and the awareness, consciousness that that gives us uh, and the cognitive abilities that provides us, which we're all so proud of, but, but actually the way we're living is destroying them. And, uh, and so uh, these cyclical comings together, ritual uh, assertion of female power, not in the male way of wanting to dominate, but in the female way of wanting to remind where the real source of life lies where the things that really matter to the continuation of humanity uh, are based. And they aren't based in men, uh, they are based in women. And the Me Too movements in recent years, the, the whole rejection of those patriarchal uh, practices, which are just so unacceptable, um, is part of women's consciousness, in a sense, returning back to that uh, uh, ancient consciousness, which is is part of women's solidarity, coming together to support one another against the alpha male, against that patriarch, trying to come in to impregnate all the females. Um, and uh, and if we then understand that within the ritual cycle of full moon, no moon, full moon, no moon. So full moon would be the time for hunting. No moon would be the time for coming home, enjoying sex, enjoying dance and music and ritual together. Um, now with COVID, we're trying to understand how we can, or at least in this re relax or releasing the lockdown, how can we do it? And it looks like it's going to be on a sort of cyclical basis that we will have a, a moment of relaxation where people can go out and travel. And then we'll have a moment of coming back together again when we need to go back into isolation, back into uh, these small... So in a sense, that rhythm is being reproduced and, and uh, Camilla and Chris are very adamant that they want that rhythm to be based on the moon because everyone can follow the moon. It's, it's the same for everyone everywhere in the world. You don't need to worry about time zones. It's either you know waning or it's waxing. And, and, and so you can start to organize yourself around that. And, and, and that might enable, for instance, international travel to return to some extent. Um, if everyone's doing it at the same time, as opposed to some people here doing it this way. And anyway, so the the who knows where life will go after this extraordinary moment that we're living in. But clearly, there are interesting uh, ways that uh, 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 the situation is pushing us back to some of these older ways of organizing ourselves. And, uh, and I really do sincerely hope that we can remember enough of those deep instincts which made us human uh, to start to refine how that can be translated in this modern context, because of course, uh, you know, it's it's a bit much to expect people to be able to dance and sing as beautifully and as with the sophistication of the Benjeli. But it's, it strikes me that what the Benjeli had in the time that I was there, and what humankind has um, throughout history and prehistory used as perhaps its primary tool for cohesion is a narrative. Um, and so obviously like um, religions and narratives, money is a narrative, like nationalism is a narrative, but our narratives now are based on all sorts of slightly confusing and, and, um, and, 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 and you know, at times helpful, but at times like counterproductive types of um, stories. 
was it struck me that when I was with the with the Vangeli that they were still holding on to the narrative that you mentioned there about how it is that they, you know, when we were doing a Jengi together, that they said, this is our, this is the story of how we first became human. And I thought you were about to tell this tale, actually, when you were talking about um, the early, early humankind. But the, 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 the Jengi story to me was like, it felt like it was being kept alive by this dance and ritual that they did, which was essentially about the women casting out the alpha male and inviting the other men in to live with them, provided that they left at the door, or not door, there's no doors in the jungle, but you know, left behind their tendency towards that aggression and competition that the alpha male had been exhibiting. So feel free to come and be with us, but you've got to leave that aspect behind and then we can live in harmony. And then they they kept the story of that alive, the narrative of that alive through this repeating of a ritual on, on occasion. Now that might be me just as a supposition, but that was the feeling I had because I've been grappling with it. It's like, why is it that, how is it that we can re-envisage re or, or reimagine a future and it struck me that narratives are at the heart of everything they're so important for us all and here was a group of people that managed to maintain a narrative for like 90 percent of our time on the planet as humans we understood they intrinsically seem to understand that if you let power get out of hand it just all goes tits up excuse my language it just it's just a mess that power cannot help but beget power and become corrupted. So they have all of these tools that they hold in order to maintain balance. The men and the women and the group as a whole, all of these tools individually and collectively, all of these things to maintain that, keeping that ticking over. And they do it because they've all bought into and remember this narrative, which is kept alive by this, this ritual. But somehow we've lost that narrative and we're living by a whole bunch of different stories now. You know, the, you, you name it, the stories that we're fed through advertising and all the stuff we grow up living, you know, the, the ideas that we're taught at school um, about how it's ever been thus, that it's been competitive and aggressive and warfare and all this stuff. But the teacher, the, the work that you've shared with us, Jerome, is that that's not always been the case. And so I think that this the reason that I'm keen on doing this work and having these conversations with you is that to try and to try and let people know that there was once upon a time a different narrative and that narrative worked for us incredibly well and there were tools that maintained it and this is how we function so well not only do we flourish but we also enjoy life and we look after each other it is a different paradigm it is a different way of experiencing life. You have to let go of that part of yourself that I learned when I was with them. You, you have to let go of that competitive element. You have to let go of that me element. You have to enter into the collective. But in its own right, it's a freedom and it's, it's, it's a freeing. But the freeing comes with a proviso. It's like you can be as free as you like. No one's going to tell you anything. But just love and buy into looking after the group. And that's it. You know, and so it's not like communism, which has got a centralized form of control that tells you that you're free to find it for yourself. But that's the invitation. The invitation is to to put the group first and that everyone steps into that lovingly. And it just struck me that that was a narrative worth reminding people about. That was a little rant. Go on, go for it, Joe. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it, Jengi really does represent this alpha male, this wild penis, and uh, and it is a very uh, wild uh, uh, ritual when it's performed. But but by performing it, people relive the reasons why society is the way it is, and it's something which I've thought a lot about. You know, in a sense, their myths are not myths as as we think of myths as this thing that's you know some distant story, some old geezer told. Um, it's, it's something that you live, that you become the, the characters of. You, you experience in, in a ritual context what it's like to be those mythical characters. And so that story is not just a story out there. It's your story. Um, and that's something we, we, we lack because we're always 
having other people tell us stories rather than becoming part of the story. Um, I, I often wonder if our sort of obsession with celebrity individuals is is, is actually that desire to uh, somehow be or commune uh, with our mythical heroes. You know, our heroes have become these sort of, well, whatever, celebrity achievers of something or other. Um, and, and, and rather than these archetypal cultural heroes who represent something very deep about the values our culture holds dear, and, and through reliving their lives in these ritual moments, we, we really take that on board as part of our own lives. And so I think you know, what we forget is the power of music and the power of how you organize musical participation. So if uh, in order to achieve uh, an appreciation of that state of that awareness, you have to uh, dance and sing and, and relive that story, then it really does make, uh, make you connect to it at a subliminal and, and non-discursive uh, level. And that's much more profound than all these rules of yes, no, don't do this, do do that, which we obsess with in our own society. Mm. And, and it provides a pathway which, which is distinctively different to that sort of male pathway that you've been mentioning, that sort of patriarchal pathway. It, it's this collaborative uh, coming together of these different gendered bodies and you know, in our society, of course, we are very sort of fixated on sexuality as being something that defines you. Uh, and whereas in these societies, uh, I remember actually in the Ajengi that you were participating in, uh, an old man put on all these women's clothes and started dancing and making everybody laugh. I think we could remember. it was very yeah. hilarious. Um, and so Benjilla are very distinctive about gendered bodies, but you're not bound to behave like that at all times. There are certain rules you have to respect because of the biological functions of your body. So menstrual blood, for instance, is a very powerful substance. Mm -hmm. And uh, women who are menstruating, or men whose wives are menstruating can't go hunting and doing all sorts of other stuff. And if you can't move camp when a woman's menstruating, you, you know, she needs to stay there. And, uh, and there are very, a whole range of different rules and so on. But, uh, but the point is really that it's, it's when men and women really collaborate together in reliving these archetypal moments, understanding the qualities that, that are valued by the society. When that's shared through music and dance, it affects us so deeply. That's why all human societies, all social groups, even within the same society, of course, you have multiple styles of song and dance, but those uh, ways that you create music are very profound uh, indicators of the values that you hold dear. And it's not the, it's, you know, we're too used to also plugging th you know, the earplugs in and listening to music. In, in most of human history, if you want to have music, you have to make the music. And it's in that making of the music that these things come, these things happen. So, uh, you know, it, it's a complex thing for Westerners because we now specialize. Oh, he's a musician. Oh, I'm not a musician. Oh, I can't dance. He can dance. For the Benjeli, that's just a, a ludicrous statement. Everybody can dance. If you can walk, you can dance. Uh, if you can talk, you can sing, um, much as they laugh at my attempts at these things. But anyway, um, <laughs> they, they, they do think of, well, at least me, as a sort of uh, a weird uh, semi-zombie-like creature and I think about white people in general because we come along with such power, aeroplanes and all these gadgets and machines and so on, and wealth uh, ad infinitum. They call us Red River Hogs. It's a bush <laughs> who uh, lives in the same forest as all the other bush, uh, all the other creatures. But has so much fat. You know, you, you you kill a bush pig and you open it. Oh, it's got loads of fat. Everyone's cheering. Uh, and it's like that with white people, you know, they're, they're in the same forest, but they've got these endless reams of money and goods and things that just produce. Uh, and so, uh, oh, I got lost with the bush pigs, sorry. Well, <laughs> Jerome, I, I've just checked the time, actually. I, I think that we, uh, we, we, we were thinking about wrapping it up around now. So, um, I don't know, it's like, uh, I could talk to you forever about this and try and unpick the things that, uh, the, these tools that I'm so interested in that I feel could somehow be applied to our society, not only in how to bring about a transition, but also how to maintain it, which is equally as hard. Um, I think we've had a, I think we've had a very um, 
beautiful first first encounter in that and then sort of like tried somehow to to paint a picture i really hope the people who who are watching uh and listening have have felt a little bit of that and i just i guess for me i just want to finish by saying you know it this is such a drive for me because it was such a profound experience it felt like it felt like of all the different places i've been and all the amazing experiences that i've had that when i finally came across a group of people who were living in such a harmonious way uh, initially i was almost em embarrassed to talk about it it felt so romantic uh, it was been so lovely when i finally met academics that were saying no bruce it's not romance this is actually an extraordinarily beautiful way that humankind did live and and it and that you know, it's not just destined to only be possible in the tropics of abundant resources there there i know because i've spoken to you before jerome that these tools and these methods could be applied to a to a wider context it we need a lot more discussion and a lot more time to really go there but there is a pathway i feel for us to to unlock a future that has some of these aspects within them but i think in a in a way what we've done today is is have the first stab uh, at least offering a new narrative which is an old narrative our, our greatest ever narrative which is that we 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 work together better when we're when we're collaborating rather than competing this is this is possible it's not romantic it's how we are best able to be and it necessitates a shift in ourselves individually and it necessitates a shift in how we perceive society because I can I can have an egalitarian and an equal relationship in my family, but certainly our society as a whole isn't. It's not geared towards that. It's geared to this massive disparity of wealth and these power bodies getting ever increasingly more powerful. That is what inspired those women to re revolt in the first place. So how are we going to find out before this type of society that we're living in now just destroys all of us and including the people who are running the show in their addictive madness it's like how can we take these elements from the past and 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 bring them into our lives today and i think we've 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 made a nice first uh, opening in that jerome so thank you so much for uh, for being with us this evening and i wonder if you have any sort of closing closing words perhaps well, thank you, Bruce, and that was uh, very beautifully put. I mean, I think this question of romantis romanticism is is very important, and it's something which you know other anthropologists have accused me of. Or, uh, and what's interesting is that when I meet anthropologists who've worked in these egalitarian societies, it's it's so often what people say, "Oh, yeah, you're just romanticizing it from your own fantasies." Um, but of course, <clears throat> if you're a uh, someone who's a development outreach officer trying to work with these groups, your life's nightmarish. No one, you know, people won't agree on anything. People will do their own thing. You'll, you'll, people will agree with you just because they want to be nice to you instead of actually telling you what they think. Um, and it can be a really difficult situation. Um, but, but, but what actually is happening when you hear about such societies is you're being reminded of something that we all know about how life should be, about how life can be and how how we should actually be trying to make life, that it can be a joyful experience. It can be something where we share our pleasures, we share our hardships, we share our, our fears, we share our woes, but we also share our joys. And um, and what that when people say, oh, you're being romantic, actually it reflects what they think is romantic. What I'm trying to do and what you've just been doing is describing as clearly as we can what we have witnessed going on in these places. And... Um, and, and, and if you find that something appealing and you think, oh, well, he must be bullshitting, he must be just romantic. Well, actually, it's because you recognize that there is something appealing. There is something very special in that. And given the number of anthropologists from all sorts of university departments around the world, over you know, 100, 150 years of, of documenting uh, communities living about in the world, uh, that we have been noticing these sorts of societies. It's not something that is a figment of our romanticism or our imaginations. It is something that genuinely exists there in the world, and it is calling us. 
and, and it's calling us at a very deep level to return to something. Our, our discomfort with inequality, our discomfort with cruelty, our discomfort with war, our discomfort with hoarding and acquisitiveness uh, are all part of that deep nature that we have. And, uh, and, and I think that one of the things that this pause, this enforced pause is doing is allowing us a bit of an opportunity to reflect on that. And, and of course, you know, the, many of the forces which have put us in this situation are directly attributable to this patriarchal, hoarding, competitive mode of, of living, which has really been trying to convert not just our planet, but our, our minds and our bodies into this sort of monoculture of market consuming, market producing entities. Uh, and, and and we live on a limited planet. We cannot have infinite growth. We have to stop somewhere. Uh, and maybe this is where we have to stop. And we now need to start to reawaken those deeper uh, understandings that we have built into us as our sort of basic cultural DNA, if you like, uh, and, uh, and try and uh, return some way to them. We've got to do it creatively. It's got to be done with imagination, with consideration. It's not going to be like small-scale societies in Central Africa or Malaysia or Borneo. Um, it's going to have to be its own unique way, and it will be different in different places because that's what's healthy. People don't do the same thing all the same time. Otherwise, it causes problems, as we see. We have to uh, support a flourishing of diverse solutions, and through all that multiple uh, experiments uh, in living in a more egalitarian way. Uh, maybe we will come up with some of the proper solutions, but unless we try, we'll never know. And I think what uh, nature is telling us now is now is the time to start trying hard uh, and to really put our, our backs into it. We've got to really make the change now. This is the decade. If we don't do it now, we're really messing up the future for our children and for their children. And that's a big responsibility. Mm. Blessings, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, thank you so much. Zach, mm -hmm. I'm sorry we drifted a little bit. We didn't get to any of the places we said we were going to go to. We were going to go to... Throughout, as were, was everyone watching through all their comments that I didn't didn't want to interrupt at any point. Um, <laughs> thank you both so much for, for sharing so many amazing stories and, and incredible insights into, yeah, I guess, what we can all do individually um, and uh, you know we do have about 30 great questions here um, so I thought I would kind of try and ask one if you guys both have time I know it's uh, we've ran a little bit over and um, if that's okay with you both and um, I'll try and kind of shape a question that kind of embodies a few other people's because we might only have time for for one or two more and I guess it kind of you, you kind of you kind of touched on it then but it's about how you know society is in, in such a state that system change seems so far out of reach for a lot of us you know addressing the root causes of, of social problems, you know, they, they're often, you know, intractable and, and embedded in these networks of cause and effect, you know, and we, we can't make institutional and systemic change individually. We can do it collectively, but it's, it seems too big often. Um, and I guess, you know, um, in this march for centralization and, and, and profit over, you know, purpose and, and um, capitalism, how, how can we all learn from, from these precious communities these egalitarian indigenous communities you speak of and um, you know i know you said that it's, it's it's a diverse range of solutions but what can we as individuals integrate into our life from these lessons on a smaller scale what can everyone watching today do and take away um for themselves well should i kick off with a couple i mean i think one of the things is the importance of joy and, and, and getting joy into your life and sharing joy with other people. And, and I don't think, you know, we have to, you need to be prescriptive about how to do it, but it's important that each of us think hard. You know, what, what are your individual qualities? How do you bring joy to the world? What is it that you do really well, and each one of us can and does, that brings joy? Do it, do it more, lots more. And, and with lots more joy in the world, I think these things start to become easier. Um, I mean, that, that for me is one of the most important things. You know, joy is important. Beauty really matters. Why does nature make us recognize beauty? Why does make, nature make us feel joyful? Because those are the important things to do. Those are the important things to cultivate. Um, aesthetics, you know, these things matter much more than we realize. Mm -hmm. 
Blessings. Yeah. Um, okay. So miners are like a multi-step plan, but uh, I think that the sort of the journey I'm on with this whole drive towards um, this being my life really is trying to share these messages is, is the first step it became really clear to me was to basically to try and inspire people to, and we've just been, I've just been exactly saying this, but like, it's to re, re um, focus the narratives. That's to me the, 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 the really biggest thing. It's like to dispel the myths that we've always been aggressive, we've always been competitive, we've always been hierarchical and all this. It's like, no, is to dispel that. And having someone like Jerome, the professor of anthropology saying, no, it's not, these are not romantic. This is, this is an actuality that a few very privileged people have had a chance to visit. I have. I've had the seed placed inside of me. I, I, I cannot escape but wanting for that to grow in my life and what I see around. It's, it's dispelling the narratives, the old narratives that are not serving us and to, and to try and have discussions with your friends about, wow, did you hear that our true ancestry is much more collaborative, much more egalitarian, much more joyful and loving and all these things and it's not romantic it's actually reality so that's one thing is just to like take that into your heart and understand it as a truism and to and to be with that and then uh, alongside that as a narrative is like okay is is then the healing journey i mean I, med I know that the medicine festival has a lot of healing aspects to it along the way but um that, that, that is it as well. Jerome and I had actually planned to get into this as part of our chat today is like, is to know oneself. It's it's one of the four steps that the Ashen Inca, uh, Jerome was telling me earlier, have for when they try and bring out a new vision for a new way. Um, mm -hmm. It's to know oneself. And that is essentially what a lot of the Eastern philosophy, a lot of the shamanic philosophy, a lot of these tools that are, are, are becoming more um, known about in our world is actually to go on the inner journey and I think that a lot of the reason that why we can't make these new steps is because we're actually carrying so many wounds and that we we are wounded individually and we're wounded societally not only with the narratives but with deep traumas that we all received from from childhood onwards um, and so I think that, that, that to, to go on that journey and to take that first step is also is paramount now many of the viewers will have already done that but we know lots of people who haven't we know lots of people who are hiding who are unwilling to go on that journey of self-reflection and i think that having these narratives of 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 these traditional ways but also these ancient peoples um for example there, there's one indigenous group who live in southeast asia that jerome told me about actually who have no form of aggression at all in their society that they see any form of aggression as a type of mental illness now how can that group with if they live like that um how can one how can one say well there's always been aggression there's always been there's always been that sort of stuff in our lives if there's a group of people who are living without any of it at all what that, I, I, I slipped a little bit, but what that says to me when we're having a discussion with our, with our friends who are unwilling to look at themselves, go on the inner journey or to take responsibility is to say, listen, actually beneath the layers of our conditioning is something really beautiful. There are people who live in this planet who live in an extraordinarily peaceful, harmonious way. For you to just tell me, no, I'm sorry, I'm just like that. I'm just, I'm, I'm just like this type of person isn't isn't good enough anymore because we know that that we know that actually societies can live in harmony and so to take that on board as well is i think another part of the narrative that i'm trying to put out there of uh, that, that inspires us to go on that journey of of, of um of self-reflection and I, I i muddled my words quite a lot there in the middle and so i know that wasn't as coherent as it could have been but um, but to me, the, these these are the central features. It's like it's like knowing it, knowing it can be true, and inspiring others to also go on that journey is the first step. How we organize ourselves thereafter, and how we get into this next space, can only ever come about once we've started on that journey of healing and and um, and. Um, 
and not only healing ourselves but healing in our communities and and inspiring you know getting out of our little bubbles and going to to go and be with the other people in our society who outnumber us so much who are carrying all those wounds you know we've got now's the time to break out of our little bubbles and go and be in the world you know we can't just stay in our ashrams and our, but we've got to get and take the wonderful learnings and the healings that we've had and get out there in the world and and see everyone as a beautiful wonderful individual and the the the, the negative antisocial behavior is just it's just wounding and that actually beneath that because we know it we know that every one of us is a beautiful being and that we can be with that and we can be bigger than that and we can allow and help them to heal too because unless we do it collectively it's just not going to happen so we've got to we've got to get out into the world and bring about this healing for us all and that means doing the work now it means getting out there um and I think knowing that beneath these layers is something beautiful is the, is the key to inspiring them to go on the journey. Because I know so many people who, who won't go inside because they just think it's full of demons. They just think it's full of, of, of negative stuff. And that's just a, not a worthwhile journey to go on. But like knowing that there's tribes out there who live in such harmonious ways, for me, is the insight that... that that inspires me to tell everyone that they can go on that journey. It's to know the destination. It exists. It can be achieved. It has been achieved repeatedly by people around the world. And now the challenge is for us to find that pathway to it. Uh, and it is, as you say, one of healing. Um, the know yourself, that uh, Ashen and Kerr thing, it's followed by cultivate the vision of how you would like it to be. So once you know yourself and you know, right, this is who I am. This is how I like to be right now. So what's my vision of the ideal space I would like around me and I would like to be inhabiting and, and cultivate that vision, take it seriously. They spent the particular group that my lovely PhD student, Carolina Komanduri worked with. They spent three years just on that question, imagining, envisioning together what that beautiful future would be. <clears throat> and once they'd done that, then they shared the vision. And with that shared vision, they worked out the actions that were necessary to make that vision a reality. And they've made it a reality. And what that did is it allowed them to escape from their history because the situation they were in was even worse than the one we're in now, in the sense that their land had been taken over by these, well, firstly, loggers and poachers and then cattle ranchers. And then even the grass wasn't growing anymore and the sand was running into the river. Uh, and, and, and they were just in, in, in ter eternal debt as you know, not being unable to do the, new, uh, the, the mathematics to keep track of their debts and not knowing the prices of things. These uh, uh, patrones would just rip them off left, right and center. And it was just an endless debt. And so how to escape from that situation? You know, it really was difficult and it, it required... This, well, luckily, you know, they have a, a very strong sort of ritual system, Karampi, the uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, that allow them as, as individuals to profoundly know themselves. And from that, they could then vision, well, what is it we'd really like to see here again? And once they'd done that, uh, over generations, over two generations, it took them, but they held that vision and each of the new people coming in contributed to that vision. And, 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 and so they made it happen. And I mean, they have done such a beautiful job uh, in that territory. If you go and see them now, uh, they can stop and sit down and talk for three days if they have to, to work something out in the community because they've made that forest that they live in so abundant in fruit, uh, nuts and other uh, foodstuffs that they, they don't need anything else. And they just say, look, we don't need money. Our wealth is in the forest. They've banned money from their community. Uh, and, and, and their wealth is the forest. It is their multi-species relationships. They don't think of forest as a bunch of trees. Forest is a, a, a multi-organism, and it's that functioning of the multi-organism which is their wealth. And, and I think, you know, it's absolutely clear that is the only wealth. There is, money is a figment. I think that's a really nice, in a sense, that you've, you've again expressed 
subtly different paradigm or subtly different system thinking going on there. One which is ours, which is like we've got a problem, we've got to fix it, and we've got to like we've got to like try and slap plasters on things to just keep the machine going. Where it seems to be what you described there, Jerome, was that here's a group of people that actually once that they've gone on the inner journey of know thyself, I think you said, well, not know thyself, that sounds a bit biblical, but know oneself, um, was to then find a vision, whatever that vision is of a future, and then share that vision and then act on that vision. Well, that, that, that's a very different way to how we do it, which is essentially what they're doing is, is severing the past. They're not getting caught up in nostalgia. You know, we, we over here, we're so caught up. Look at all the conflicts we have. Look at all the power dynamics between different cultures. And and we're so caught up in our ancestral baggage. And actually what they had there was like, you know, if we're going to if we're going to solve this, we've got to let go of that and step into a new beautiful vision. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. Uh, what's interesting about them is they they really the source for them of their strength is their deep ancestral past. Uh, and that is their, their indigenous culture, their tradition. And in a sense, what's happened to us in the West is because we have such a hodgepodge of traditions all coming together to, to, to participate in this system we've now created. In a sense, maybe it is you know what you've been talking about, Bruce, so uh, uh, keenly for the past few years. It is that egalitarian past. It is that deep history of living as egalitarian hunter-gatherers, which is now our, all we have left of our deep ancestral tradition, because we've lost, we've destroyed through this sort of arrogance of progress, this uh, you know uh, sort of fascism of development that you're constantly having to improve, 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 and you'll become modern one of these days. But we're always becoming modern. You can never be modern. Um, and, and, and instead we sort of step back and realize that there is this deep, uh, deep shared understanding of what a good human life should be like and, and what a flourishing human life should be like. And that's where we can find that inspiration again, where we can find what the Ashaninka found in their Ashaninka tradition, which you know we have now lost, uh, not everywhere of course, but certainly people like me and, uh, and people like you, I presume, uh, as much as I know you, Bruce. Um, but, uh, you know, most of us have lost our traditions and those traditions have died with the old folk that, that uh, you know, whenever it was, uh, were invaded by Rome or whatever it was that, that caused that story to happen. And, uh, and that's our hope, is tapping in there. Thank you for that extensive answer. You're both clearly um, incredible advocates for this, for this vision, you know, this profound vision. And, I guess embodying, you know, and what these indigenous have, have shared with you guys. And um, we've got like ten great questions. Do you want to take one or two quickly and try and summarise the answers as briefly? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how good we are at summarising, but just far away till you run out of time, Zach. I reckon probably, probably really one more, more in, knowing me and Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a go, anyway, and we'll see where we end up. There's quite a lot of people still tuned in, so people are still engaged, evidently. Um, we'll go for this one, which is one of the first ones that came in, which is talking about current affairs somewhat. I um, hope you can both see that. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about harmful conspiracy theories around COVID-19, which seems to be causing social fragmentation and disabling activism. How would you both relate this to the balance between collective and individual freedom? Who'd like to begin? Mm -hmm. In one sense, <laughs> I mean, I don't really see it in those terms. I think that's the problem I have with that question or answering that question. But briefly, um, individual freedom is not about just saying whatever you like and that being okay. You know, there is a shared reality that we all participate in. And what always impresses me wherever I go in the world is those people who look carefully at what is happening around them. You know, we see eye to eye. Um, I think it's part of what happens when you visit one of these egalitarian societies. So many people are observing really clearly what's going on uh, that you immediately feel a sense of, of brotherhood or sisterhood, a, a sense of, of, of a shared understanding. Um, and what I see with you know, so many of these conspiracy theories is that, you know, it's just ego. It's, it's people wanting to be right and and just jumping on whatever particular bits and nuggets of something they can to then create a, an idea. You know, 
Go to the experts, people who spend all their lives thinking about these issues. You know, you break your leg. You don't go and see, you know, the girl next door. You go to the bloody hospital. You go and see the people who really know how to deal with that. Uh, and so it should be with these things. You know, trust these people. It's it's obvious that people can lie and cheat, and you need to always have your guard and, and, and assess information, uh, triangulate, corroborate. Uh, um, but... Uh, but, but, you know, I think we are in this, it's this, you know, fake news era. You know, it's just my ego is big and my voice is loud. So I'll tell you what is and what isn't. The Trumpist sort of approach. But, uh, but that, you know, it's really about evidence. It's about weighing that evidence, watching, seeing, trying not to, uh, you know, over-influence things with your own bias. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a really big question actually it's uh, something i've been posting about on facebook recently um so i get it why people are distrustful of mainstream information sources um they they have been shown to have been collaborating with power sources and so there are a number of what would once have been considered conspiracy to have come into fruition. I mean, conspiracy clearly does happen in the world. Whether it's a theory or whether it's a reality is a different question. And some people obviously get very caught up in theories um, and don't do due diligence. And there's a lot of there's a lot of um, broadcast uh, media out there at the moment that's doing no due diligence at all. It's literally just expressing views without any form of um, seem to be checking up and people are just absorbing that because it offers them an insight into something that, that makes things clear for them and i think a lot of the time when it comes to conspiracies that we we want an answer it's very complex and difficult to live in such uncertainty where we feel so powerless and to have an answer which is there's a cabal of powerful people who are trying to like control us it, it at least gives us something to grapple with and it's very comforting as opposed to the complete like uncertainty and disempowerment that can come from just being a, a leaf in the wind at this particular time in history and so I, I get it why people tend towards these and of course I think that within many of the conspiracy theories there is a, a kernel of truth I mean powerful people do conspire to hold on to power and that has always been the case and occasionally they come to rise but I think that a lot of the time with conspiracies, there's people who, who um, it, it becomes so convenient and so compelling and the evidence and the information becomes so much about these cabals of power that, that it, it becomes ridiculous, in, in my view, to, to imagine how that could come about. You know, the amount of people that would need to be in on the conspiracy for it to, to happen is just implausible when you think how many people are in every airport fitting on fucking gas cylinders to spray us all including them and their families when they go home i mean like some conspiracies just completely beyond the realms of practicality let alone plausibility in my view but i don't discount that people that are searching for truth in this sort of post-truth area where the most powerful person in the world is clearly lying on a daily basis it's like people are grappling for information so i get that but to the to the main point of the question and i'm sorry i did you know you did give me a complex on that for god's sakes uh so you know how does it how how does where we're at can, can fit with this sort of collective versus individual aspect well it's a question i asked jerome actually i before we came on, I was like, how would the Ben Jelly cope with having sort of draconian central authority telling you you can't leave your home? Well, basically, the, my, what Jerome said to me was like, and what, what I see myself with, with, um, with, with uh, egalitarian groups is that there is no coercion. So people don't receive coercion. They, they, might, they might, as Jerome said, they might go, yeah, 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 but actually completely go and do the other thing because people are not controlling each other. And there is no central power body because they work on a daily basis to ensure that power doesn't get out of hand. So everyone is an individual. And so I think this is what the question is aiming at. How the, so everyone is an individual and they would not respond well to coercion from a central power body. Having said that, they probably would if they were in this sort of 
a, a tribal group, which is something I talk, touched on earlier. It's like, yes, they're individual and there's no coercion, but what their, their, their choice, their freedom, their liberty that they've received from everyone allowing them to be themselves, they offer that by then choosing from my place of freedom, I'm choosing to be a good citizen. I'm choosing to be think of the group beyond myself. And so as a result, they wouldn't need to be told to stay inside, but if they were given the correct information and they trusted the source of information and that source of information said, you know what, we would be better off looking after our healthcare workers and our elderly if we all stayed inside for a while, they would just do it anyway. If that was the consensus, of what was the responsible thing to do for the group, the group is more important than the individual when you're given the freedom to make that choice because you know it serves the whole and the whole serves you. And that would be my answer to that question. Thank you so much, Bruce. Short and sweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no uh, need to talk as of Zach. <laughs> Let's go for one final one, and before we wrap things up, um, I don't quite make sense of it, but I really love the the, the heart behind it. So, it's uh, it's is it just about supporting each other against the patriarch, or is there something about what is happening within women's bodies around their connection to creation, to Earth, and to the Moon? I'm not quite sure what the context of the question is, but it's really lovely. Can you leave it up? Can you leave it up? Of course, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to let this is the last question. So if I'll go first, Graham, I'd like you to finish because I think you probably have much more to say on this. Um, but one thing that I was thinking when we were having our chat about the patriarchy was that the, the, the thing that Jerome and I have 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 touched on and what we've seen, especially with the Benjeli, where it's very evident the, the the group in the Congo that Jerome knows so well, is that the answer to patriarchy isn't matriarchy. Matriarchy in its own right is another form of hierarchy. And the women have the wisdom to know that if they stayed and held on to power, then they would become corrupted in their own right. So they then retreat and allow the men to come in. And it's the play and the balance between the two forces of energy, the two, the two different qualities of power, that is the thing that maintains the harmony within the group. So I just wanted to offer that. And if you stick the question up again, again, I'll I'll see if there's anything more I can say. Is it just about supporting each other against the patriarch? Is there something about what's happening within women's bodies and their connection to creation and earth and moon? Um, I, I don't know how well I could answer that. I think that um, you know the the bit that the bit that I've got struggled with in this whole realm of um, of the 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 sort of the very binary view of sex and gender that the Benjeli have compared to the very spectral view that we're enjoying today, and um, and of course there's a difference between masculinity and femininity and men and women, and within all of us we have both, and so it I don't know whether the the future. If if this if this insight of the Benjeli is is of of going to be of, of help to us as a society going forwards, I don't know whether that means that we become more binary and that works, or whether it just means that we have to work at these different forces within us all and bring them about. But what I what I believe is that the that the the, the what the Benjeli would see is the more masculine aspects of aggression and and competition which of course is in with all of us in society here today, but in the Benjeli, it would probably be more ex exhibited within the, the, the men, um, but that needed to be left to one side in order for everyone to get together. And I think that, so what uh, Jung, I think, called the anima, is the femininity of within the masculine, is the thing that I think would be good to cultivate in our society. And, and I don't want to speak for women and what, what their, what their, um, future or what their desires or, or are for going forwards, but all I all I believe is that um, when women come together without any external forces on them from men, when they're really truly free to be able to decide what they want to be, and when they truly are able to connect to, to the earth and the moon and their own inner bodies and all of those things in their own without not being in the workplace in a masculine, but just purely on their own, 
I trust and believe that they will find something that will be beneficial for society. And that's as far as I can take it, really. I just genuinely believe and trust in them. And I, I wish for that. And I ask for and invite that and offer that space because I feel that that would be so nourishing for all of society now, uh, especially in the realm of making decisions on a much bigger, in a much bigger place, you know, because obviously f there is a, there is a resurgence of female power in our society and it's a beautiful thing, but it's not, it's still the men's rules at the top of the game, pretty much. Um, and it's still that competitive hierarchical space that we are ro ruling our show by. And I wonder what would happen if that was occupied differently from a different energy force within us whether it's however that manifests i don't know i just I, I wish for more of the feminine qualities of society to come uh, and I, I know that i get myself in hot water when i get into this space but there's a yearning having had the experience of seeing what what beauty and power can be in in those sorts of societies that i feel I feel a yearning for something like that in our society now. Bruce. Um, all right. I mean, I, 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 it, it's a big question. Uh, it goes actually to the basis of the sexual division of labor in human societies right across the world, which is to do with the division of blood. Uh, and so men's blood is the blood of killing animals. Women's blood is the blood of creation, of procreation, uh, as represented by menstrual blood. Uh, if you think about it, other mammals, the females of her species, of the species, shows her fertility at the moment when she's most fertile through her blood. Uh, women show, uh, human uh, females show their fertility at a moment when they're not fertile. And the switching of that sign is of extreme importance and interest. And it's something which we don't have time to discuss here. But uh, I notice in the chat there are quite a few people who want to hear Ingrid and Camilla. And I reckon that uh, if you've got Ingrid and Camilla in conversation with Bruce, we could have a, a very rich exploration of this theme uh, in its proper context. Um, but what I would like to say is that it's not just about anything. It's always many things. Uh, you know, so, of course, we need to resist the patriarch and, and men today need to support women in creating and claiming a space for themselves to start to do the sort of imagining the experimentation that Bruce is alluding to in his answer. Um, and, and that's a really important thing to do. Um, the business of the moon, uh, the moon is at the heart of being human. It's actually at the, at the root of life on Earth. If the moon hadn't bounced into this planet as a huge asteroid and set it on its spin and dumped a bunch of iron in its core to create the magnetic field that gives us gravity and so on, uh, or contributes to holding the atmosphere in, um, we, uh, we really wouldn't have life on this planet. So the moon in a very deep way is, is concerned with life on this planet. And women's bodies are connected in a very deep way to that precisely because of this cycle, this ancient cycle I was talking to of light, of dark moon uh, and full moon. Uh, and you know men being pushed away to go and hunt and then return back to the women with the food for sex. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the body, the women, women's bodies in the moon is a really important reconnection for women in our society to make. You know, you take the pill, you can, there are all sorts of ways you can chemically disturb your cycle. Um, but, but there's something important about just connecting to your cycle as a source of your power as a woman, as opposed to seeing it as something negative, dirty or, or embarrassing or, or whatever. It is the source of women's power. That is the evidence of your procreative ability. To one body can become two or three. You know, I mean, that really is miraculous if you just think about it for a moment or two. Uh, it's a big power women have, and it's it's something that that uh, you know, be proud of it. Don't uh, don't be shy. Mm. Thank you so much, Jerome. I've learned a lot today, uh, as I'm sure all of our audience have. And there's so many um, amazing questions, but I feel that two hours is probably a good point to to cut this off. Only. <laughs> as planned and um, but feel free to go through the comments perhaps afterwards maybe there's any you feel feel the need to um, answer that would be amazing um but i'm gonna thank you both so much for, for sharing your insight your wisdom with us today um 
anyone that might have joined this late or, or did miss this and wants to share it's gonna be on our youtube and our facebook um you can check out um flourishing diversity the website is on the screen there um, but it's flourishingdiversity.com um, and then also i don't have the toy website up but um this is bruce perry's most recent documentary um i think i'm right in saying bruce it's the the nomadic hunter gatherers work in borneo for their inner feelings of connection to nature which is which is really really profound um so you can check that out on that website too um and thank you and um, many of you may know that medicine is a registered community interest company which in essence means that when we make profits um, all of this will go to to help empower indigenous communities you know that protect 80% of our world's rainforest that, that Bruce and Jerome have been speaking of today. And um, I guess in order to preserve and protect not only their land, but, but their traditions and their wisdom also. Um, so next week we'll be joined by Al Noor Ladha. He's also uh, speaking at Medicine Festival. He's going to offer an interactive discussion, I guess, as he leads us through a journey into the heart of sacred activism. Um, so thank you all so much. Uh, we'll see you at 8 p.m. Um, and yes, blessings. Stay safe. Lots of love, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. Joe. Lots of love. Thank you.